Hey everybody, Fresco Kinos here. So I tried to get ChatGPT to write this lecture for me, but I didn't want to do that to you guys. Um, in a professional situation, you're going to be called upon to write memos, write letters, um, write a resume, maybe a cover letter um, to get your career going, to get promoted. And what you want to make sure is that you know how to write something that with clarity and something that's going to be read, that's going to be succinct and to the point and effective. So like anything, this is going to come with practice, but there is a formula that you can use. And the first step is to come up with an idea of how to pre-write this and then compose a draft. And you might want to like rush right into that and then revise that. So kind of like a brainstorming and then you would revise it and tighten it up. So in your pre-write, you're going to say to yourself, what is my goal? What do I want to bring to my target audience? How will they receive that message? And then how am I actually going to send it to them? Do I need to make them a video, a PowerPoint, a letter, a text? Should I call them on the phone? What's the best channel for that communication? The next thing when I'm drafting it, I like the idea of really just brainstorming it and banging it out, kind of, you know, put your ideas down. Don't, you know, worry about spell check and grammar and everything. You just bang it out. And um, again, thinking about your target audience, you may have to do some research. Let's say we're looking at that job thing. So I may want to research the company. I got the job description, but I want to look at their website. I want to think about the corporate culture there. Um, just give me some background that I can use to, you know, write my draft and then kind of reorganizing it, you know, maybe moving things around, cut and pasting, prioritizing information that's more important in that first draft. And then think about editing it. There are lots of ways to do that. You know, you can kind of um, record yourself doing it or you can um, transcribe it that way. You can um, do it on paper. You can have someone else read it for you, read it out loud, all kinds of ways, you know, read it from the point of view of the audience, right? Put yourself in the person in HR who's reading this resume, put it in, in, in their shoes. Um, and then, of course, check it for errors, right? You want to make sure you run it through your spell check, your grammar check. You want to proofread it very carefully and think about how you're going to really, you know, get that message through. Is there a call to action? You know, was the message effective? I sent someone a message telling me, you know, to reply to my email and I get a reply right away or I don't get a reply for weeks. What's the difference? Is it my fault? Right? So the idea is you got to do your homework. You got to shape your message and you got to do your research first. Let's say you're writing that, you know, cover letter and then later on you find out something new about the company that you never knew before. Now you got to go back in there and rewrite the whole thing. So the idea is that no savvy business person would draft anything without doing some basic research first. You could ask yourself some basic questions, you know, what they know already. Think about that basic communication model. Who's my target audience? What's their background? What do I want them to do? What's the call to action? When do I want them to do it? How do I want them to do it? And what happens if they don't do it? What am I going to do to follow up on that? So in today's digital age, you got to make sure your writing is really tight because people aren't going to go through your blog post if they find something in the beginning that doesn't turn them on, that doesn't entice them to read forward. Uh, and again, research is something that you're going to do here to really make that work. So searching the company's files, talking with the boss, interviewing someone, creating a survey, just brainstorming your ideas. These are all ways of conducting kind of informal research at first. So when you're conducting your research and you're getting your data, there's two ways to go about it. You have the secondary data and you have the primary data. The secondary data is stuff that's already out there. So you get it from reliable sources. It's probably not going to be that expensive. Um, there's all kinds of things that it's published and it's already there. Primary data 
is much more kind of costly and time consuming, but the advantage is it can be really customized. So I might do a survey again, or a focus group, or conduct interviews that are related just to my brand, just to my company. And that's going to give me obviously much more tailored data, but getting it is going to require some cost and some time frame. So here's another sample. Again, if I'm conducting my own, let's say, scientific research, um, I want to make sure that I'm testing everything and um, the idea is that it's going to take time. I can't just go through this right away and i got to have the budget to put all this together. Um, secondary data, on the other hand, can be a great way to kind of just cull information that's already out there, that's already been fact-checked, used already before, and it's hopefully reliable. So I'm sure in some AMC class you've had a brainstorming session to work with your group on a project. And the session, you want to kind of have someone who's going to record that flow, right, because it's going to be spontaneous. You want to make sure that it's creative and that you have lots of ideas, right? You don't want to just have, you know, anything will work in a brainstorming session. Um, so you're not really worried so much about quality, you just want to have quantity and uh, no judgment, right? Whatever it is, we put it up there. It could be the craziest idea ever, um, but it might actually fly, right? And then the idea of um, criticism about this is that in a brainstorming session, it might be the extrovert who's you know, giving all the ideas and uh, other people are just being really kind of laid back and quiet about it. Uh, maybe do it online through an asynchronous uh, you know, event. This way uh, everybody can make sure that they contribute. But I think there's a certain dynamic to a brainstorming session that is done face-to-face -face where people can uh, really kind of have an interpersonal exchange of ideas that is going to be very effective. One approach that works for me a lot as a visual thinker is doing a mind map. So you can do this online. There's a lot of interesting websites. Uh, Millinote is a really nice one. You want to take a look. I'll give you guys some more background information on it. Uh, but the idea of you know doing that kind of drawing or graph or kind of infographic look where you're putting together you know what your goals are and maybe how you're going to get to them step by step and all the other uh, kind of analyses that you might put together that um, you know might be your threats and your advantages and your cost or whatever it is. Um, just kind of visually mapping it out really helps you to you know kind of think the whole process through. So as a professional business writer, you want to make sure that you organize your writing. I like an outline; it works really nicely. It's a great way to kind of start things together. So the idea of a strategic kind of sequencing where, you know, you go from the topic sentence to the body copy to the closing and you really understand what the reader is taking away from this so that they don't become the idea of an or unorganized message might lead the reader you know, what, what did I just read? What do they want me to do? Um, you, you don't want that. You want to be as clear as water in business. A puzzled reader is someone who is not going to read through the whole message and uh, they're going to become So as a professional business writer, think about how this will affect your next communication, your next email, your next memo, your next letter, and that structure is going to really work for you. The book offer is a nice kind of template here that you can look at when you're structuring your next communication. You don't have to obviously use all of them, but you can kind of look at this as a good guideline and saying, you know, am I hitting these points? So if you look at a business letter from 50 years ago and one today, they almost look the same. But using electronic media like email and text, you know, an email from 20 years ago looks totally different than one today. So a lot of these things are still evolving and depending on who's reading your email, how they're reading it, what their, you know, platform is, things are always going to be a little bit different. And the style set is something that is, you know, very volatile still. It's still evolving. But there is a structure. And just the idea of, you know, having a opening, a body, and a closing is a start for that structure. And then you can start to build into that, depending on what document. So it might be a series of steps. Um, I would like to do it typically as a bulleted list, you know, 
again, fragmented sentences, short, succinct. Um, someone doesn't have time to read through a dissertation, paragraphs. Get the job done with a bulleted list. Works really nice. For an informal report, you want to have some type of introduction and then data. It's nice to have that data visualized, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So instead of, you know, a Excel spreadsheet, it's much nicer to give an infographic, a chart, uh, a graph, uh, an animated chart, something like that is going to give you a lot more um, kind of valued communication. Um, and then the idea of some type of summary where you kind of told, tell them what you told them already, but in a very succinct kind of wrap up, and then maybe that call to action of what they're going to do with this information. Um, so lots of analytical reports, again, might be um, fact finding, you know, data listing again, and then some type of conclusion from that data, and then a further recommendation. How we are going to increase our market share next year, uh, looking at um, the changes brought about by COVID. And then a typical proposal might include, you know, uh, we need a new studio at FIT because students have to have the latest video equipment to understand how to create content in today's industry. Uh, proposed solution, um, hire a video consultant to design a new studio for us. Staffing considerations, well, we need uh, a chief engineer, we need a teaching assistant in the lab at all times. A schedule, the job needs to be done when classes aren't in session, so we're going to reserve it for the summer of 2023. A budget. Well, where's the money going to come from? The college is going to grant us half the money. The rest of the money we're going to try to get from outside backers. And then an authorization request, maybe right up to the chief financial officer. Um, are we ready to proceed? You might have to go through legal too. some of these things, right? It's where it's going to be kind of analyzed by a lawyer to make sure that, you know, everything is upfront and uh, we're not going to be sued or whatever after um, we start the process. So there's different ways to structure this. You know, you can have what's called an indirect strategy or a direct strategy. So the direct strategy is where you kind of put things right up front in a topic sentence, in a subject line, what's going on. In an indirect strategy, you might give some background information first and then hit with the real punchline. A lot of times this could be used when you're giving bad news. Um, you know, someone's being laid off, budget cuts, things like that, might use an indirect strategy. So in business, I'm usually a fan of the direct strategy, which is sometimes called front-loading, where right in the subject line and the topic sentence, you let people know what you want to get accomplished. This saves the reader time, it also sets a proper frame of mind, and it reduces frustration in the long run. So the idea of being upfront, front-loading, is usually the way to go. So we might reserve the indirect strategy for bad news, right, where we kind of give some background information first, and then we hit them with the, uh, you know, the bad news of budget cuts or price raising or layoffs, uh, some type of sensitive news. Oftentimes this can also be used to persuade someone's opinion about something. So you've been asked to draft a memo for the latest sales pitch here, and you've just got writer's block. You can't get started. What can help you get started? Just like we had that brainstorming, the idea of free writing. Um, you don't even have to write. You can just turn your recorder on and start a kind of train of thought and brainstorm it, um, kind of just conversationally, as if you were explaining it to a 10-year-old, uh, ramble off, and then listen to that back and transcribe it. Then you can start to organize your ideas and work from an outline. Um, always good, obviously, to work in a quiet environment. Turn off your phone, you know, try to eliminate as much distraction as possible so that you can focus. And think about what writing style actually fits this. So, you know, who's the audience? Um, what is the expected tone of this? Have I written to this person before? Um, what kind of rapport do we have? 
um, you know, what kind of stylistic things am I going to use? You know, am I going to be very formal, dear Mr. Kokinos, or am I going to be like, hey, Mike, uh, in the subject, you know, area? So. so it's not an English class, but we have to kind of look at some of the sentence structure, and hopefully I can go quickly through this. The idea of a simple sentence, which is very nice um, in business writing because it's succinct and clear is a you know simple sentence with a subject and a verb. Our company lacked a social media presence. Very simple. So here we take it to the next level with two complete but related thoughts and it's a compound sentence. Our company lacked a social media presence and it hired a specialist. Um, so the idea is these two thoughts are bridged by something. Typically we have our comma, we have our um, semicolon, which means that there are usually two separate sentences that are being joined together, and we might also use a contraction, like the word and, but, therefore, those are all kind of connectors that help you uh, structure the sentence. Now here it is presented as a compound complex sentence. We have two independent clauses and one dependent clause. Because our company lacked a social media presence, comma, it hired a specialist, semicolon, However, comma, our brand required time to build. So when you think about this, it actually becomes a little bit more confusing to try to build a sentence with all these elements in there. At least to me, I would recommend actually breaking this down into multiple sentences to be clearer in a form of business communication. So it's really important to not sound like an idiot also when you're doing any type of business communication because you want someone to have a certain sense of credibility when they're reading you know, your work. And they're not going to buy from you if you've got a typo or you know, spelling grammatical error in there. Um, so you want to make sure you're aware of some basic things in uh, typical English writing and um, the idea of avoiding a fragment. So going to FIT because I want a career in marketing. So the first, actually both of these sentences are fragments. And you could put together a new sentence that kind of combines them, saying something like, I'm going to FIT, comma, because I want a career in marketing. So the idea is you're combining those two fragments into a more complex sentence, but it actually has a complete thought. Because of the rain is a fragment. Because of the rain, comma, the party was canceled, is a complete sentence. I would really turn it around to the party was canceled because of the rain. Again, thinking that, you know, what's most important here? The subject is the party, not the rain. So I'm going to put that first. So be careful when you use commas. You know, the idea is that a comma is a way to pause in a sentence. Um, but you don't want to make two sentences joined by a comma. So here we have this, what's called a comma splice. Koala bears are not actually bears, comma, they are marsupials. But really, those are two separate sentences. So they should really read either with a semicolon or with a period as two separate sentences. We also have the kind of joining here with the contraction in the last one. Koala bears are not actually bears. In fact, they are marsupials. Another common error that I see is the idea of a run-on sentence, where you're trying to pack too much into one sentence without some type of punctuation or a conjunction, maybe, or even just making them two sentences. So Lila enjoyed the bouquet of tulips John gave her on Prime Night, however she prefers roses. So kind of like two separate thoughts there, so it might be two separate sentences to make an improvement. Lila enjoys the bouquet of tulips John gave her on Prom Night, semicolon, however, comma, she prefers roses. So here's an interesting tip about length. Sentences typically are about 20 words, but in business they should be shorter. Um, this study shows that eight-word sentence had a hundred percent comprehension rate, whereas the 28-word sentence only had a 50%. So the moral of the story here is to keep it very succinct. Um, one way, I think, again, is just to read it out loud. Oftentimes when you read it out loud, you'll find yourself, well, gee, that is a run-on. You know, 
uh, we talk in much shorter sentences than we write oftentimes. So the idea of good business writing might be in the you know sense of how you would explain it if you were doing it orally and then transcribing it. Try it like that. So then you got the thing that you want people to really pay attention to, right? You want to create some type of emphasis. Now I overdid it up here, right? I used everything. So I underlined, which I really don't like. Actually before when I had this um, in lower case, the underline was actually touching the P and sometimes it will make like a Y look like a V. So try to avoid underlining. It kind of works with caps. Uh, caps is obviously another way to make something stand out. You don't want to overdo caps. Obviously in text it means that you're shouting. Um, it's also hard to read all caps. Uh, the lowercase letters let us scan the lines a little bit easier. So if you had a business document that was in all caps, it would be a little bit cumbersome for the reader. Um, I use some dashes here. Maybe that can make things stand out. I definitely overdid the explanation points. Again, one explanation point might work better. You don't want to overdo it or else you're almost like crying wolf. It becomes, you know, too much. Um, emoticons? Eh, I don't know, right? You know, again, you don't know who's reading this, how they're going to perceive that, if it's the right icon or whatever, uh, if they really understand what that means. So I would try to you know, not use any emojis and things like that in your writing. Um, what else is going on here? There's some interesting colors that could work. Size change could work. Um, and then I have this background color. All those things could work. But again, you don't want to overdo it, right? I kind of made it look like a circus here. I brought out every, you know, tool in the book. And the idea is to, uh, you know, again, think about your reader and what you want to say. And if you overdo it, then you might lose that emphasis. The other thing is, you know, the actual content itself. So things like word choice, you know, finding the right word to fit your message and also position. We talked about the idea of the important information up front, direct, or the important information to follow, a little background, indirect. Which one is going to work? Again, it depends on your subject matter, the goal of your communication, and also your target audience. So then we have this idea of active and passive voice. So I give the example, Michael posted the message. This is active, right? Michael is posting the message. The passive voice is the message was posted by Michael. So now the message becomes more important than the poster. So again, you want to think about which one is the most important. Um, the active voice tends to be a little cleaner, a little clearer. I like it better in a business uh, sense. Um, the book talks about how the passive voice can be, again, a little more indirect and maybe, you know, for the bringer of bad or negative news or to kind of hide the person who was doing the action and emphasize the action itself, like the posting, not so much Michael, that might be better to use the passive voice. There's also this idea of speaking in the first person uh, or the second person. So in a resume, I would say, I created a marketing plan for the university. I wouldn't say Michael created a marketing plan for the university. I wouldn't speak about myself in the second voice or the second tense because I'm speaking from myself, right? So the idea is that you really want to speak from the first person when you're speaking about something that you're doing. So just some more examples here. The active voice, Madison must submit a tax return, passive voice, a tax return, which should really be must be submitted, right? Not necessarily by Madison. Officials reviewed all tax returns. All tax returns were reviewed by officials. In the active voice, we cannot make cash refunds. In the passive voice, cash refunds cannot be made. Now, I think this actually works. So if I'm reading like a contract, um, I'm going to be less taken aback by cash refunds cannot be made um, than we cannot make cash refunds, right? It's a little too strong. So if it's, again, this negative connotation or the bringer of bad news, it might be better to use the passive voice. So here's this idea of parallelism. So the first one is a conference organizer must arrange for the venue, the hospitality, and a person to give the keynote speech. So the venue, the hospitality, the keynote speech, that would be more parallel it kind of almost relates to like a musical composition. There's a certain rhythm in the writing. So listen to it this way now. A conference organizer must arrange for the venue, the hospitality, and the keynote speaker. 
So it has that certain parallel technique where we're using the in each part of it. Again, the idea of reading this out loud, where you can really experience the cadence of it, you know, how it actually sounds when someone's reading it, they're kind of mentally doing this, um, can help you to refine your writing. So the dangling and misplaced modifier, it's kind of like almost poetic some of these, right? The dangling modifier, um, driving through Malibu Canyon, the ocean came into view. But who's driving? It could be something like when we were driving or when I was driving. Uh, through Malibu Canyon, the ocean came into view. That would be clearer. A misplaced modifier. Fodder, sorry, firefighters rescued a dog from a burning car that had a broken leg. So again, obviously the car didn't have a broken leg. It was the dog. So firefighters rescued a dog with a broken leg from a burning car. Makes more sense. So just think about how that structure connects, right? So it's, you know, asking that question, who, what, and making that connection. It's I who was driving. It's the dog who had the broken leg. So words come together to make sentences. Sentences come together to make paragraphs. Paragraphs come together to make the document. And the idea is to structure it so that it makes sense. You might want to think about, you know, the topic sentence or the topic paragraph being up front and then the supporting ideas and then the closing paragraph with a call to action, deadlines, dates, things like that. I like the idea of getting to the point with the topic paragraph right up front because, again, thinking in business, my reader does not have a lot of time to scan through everything and I want them to understand what the importance and the crux of the message is right up front. After your topic paragraph, your topic sentence, you want to give some support, some evidence, and some explanation with the body copy. But again, keeping your paragraphs succinct and short is going to work much better in a business communication. You're not writing a novel. Then read your overall thing for a coherency. The idea that your topic sentence is supported and it kind of has a logical flow straight through that every sentence, every paragraph kind of dovetails and flows from one to the other supporting the overall message. Sometimes you open up a document and the page is just grayed with text. There's no breaks. There's uh, just, you know, nothing but text on the page. It's very unappetizing. It's very daunting and intimidating. The idea of breaking things up and just the way you kind of structure it. Think about, you know, your Microsoft Word class uh, where you made paragraph spacing, where you made line spacing, where you did page breaks, just to kind of chunk the information, uh, make it more kind of palatable, um, keeping it short, I think, is the way to go and, you know, read it for fat, just cut out that fat, get to the point. That's the overall crux of a good business communication. So to summarize, the next time you are drafting a professional email, memo, letter, think about your writing process. Did you do your research? Did you outline your ideas? Did you come up with a draft? Have you proofread and revised that draft? Have you thought about your overall goals and your target audience? And what do you think you can do to improve your writing? Think about what your weaknesses are. Um, maybe you need to have a spell check a little bit more or um, grammar check um, or you are you know, guilty of run-on sentences or dangling modifiers. Um, what can you do to improve those things?